Welcome back at our lectures on the sanctuary. And before we start, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word in depth, especially as relating to the sanctuary, relating to our own lives and salvation. Will you guide us through your Spirit in Jesus' name? Amen. Somebody was just telling me about um, not knowing that Jesus represented the king, the high priest, and the prophet. Because all three were anointed. And that's your greatest proof, one of your greatest proofs of the Godhead. I know there are issues about anti-Trinitarianism, right, um, in, in our church as well. But I want you to show you that is a proof because God is the king, Jesus is the high priest, and the Holy Spirit is the prophet. And Jesus represents the Godhead, all three of them, anointed in salvation for us. And then we're going to look at then Jesus as a divine human person in that building. We have done all the physical aspects of that building from, from the, the, the footings of the boards, and the, the, the gold-plated things and, and the altars and the furnitures and the, the, the high priest's garments, the camp, how it's arranged around the sanctuary. We've looked at all those physical things. Now we need to go deeper and look at what is the meaning of all these things. So we're going to work in layers. So this layer is going to talk about how everything in the sanctuary is related to Jesus. And then this afternoon, we've, we're going to skip some of the lectures because I would like to invite all of you to come and hear how it relates to the to prophecy specifically. Looking at the sanctuary and looking at prophecy. And then on Sunday, tomorrow, we will look at how it relates to salvation and the heavenly reality and how it shows us a complete system of truth. That is tomorrow. So this afternoon we'll just speak about prophecy. How the feast days, Daniel and Revelation, how it relates to the sanctuary message. So don't miss that this afternoon. But just this morning, we're going to focus on Christ and how all these things point to Jesus. And we're going to see some interesting, interesting things. In Isaiah 8 verse 14, we did read the text, which is actually a prophecy on the Messiah. Isaiah 7 14. The whole book of Isaiah is the prophet that speaks a lot about the Messiah coming. All right. So he's called the, the Old Testament uh, prophet that speaks about the Messiah. He shall be for a sanctuary. He shall be for a sanctuary. Who is this he? That is Christ. So he will be a place of refuge. He will be a place of holiness unto us. We need to be in Christ Jesus. That's where we need to be. In Revelation 21, verse 3 and 21, we get the same thought. When we go right to the end of the Bible, we find this text. Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and He will dwell with them. Isn't that the message of the sanctuary? God says, I want to dwell with them. So now we are now in Revelation 21. And Revelation 21 is what? Everything is already finished now. Right? New heaven and new earth. God's desire was to be with His people. In their sinful condition, he still wanted to be with them. The promise that he will then, at the end, also be with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them, and be their God. And I saw the temple therein. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Can you see here? Many people are asking, you know, is there a temple going to be in heaven there? No necessary for a building to be up there then. Because the Bible says that the, the Lamb and the God Almighty is the temple of it. Right? God's presence there with His people, finally. In the book of John 1, 45, sees this interesting text. Um, we have found Him of whom Moses in the law 
and the prophets did write Jesus of Nazareth. Now, the, when these words were spoken, there was no New Testament. So the Old Testament is referred to here, the law and the prophets, which is usually Torah, the five books of Moses, and the rest of the prophets. Sometimes they divide it to the Psalms as well. But usually the Psalms are also actually uh, prophetic in nature. So we have the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets. That's how the Bible is divided. Now I want to actually share with you something very, very interesting uh, before we go along. Uh, as a church, we believe that we have the testimony of Jesus, the faith of Jesus, the spirit of prophecy. I want to just put the thought into your mind. Is that when, when we speak about the spirit of prophecy, we speak about um, inspired writings. The inspired writings is God's word. Okay? Very important. So we see the inspired writings of Alan White as also uh, part of um, what we need to follow, its inspiration and so forth. So we see all inspired writings as the testimony of Jesus. When, when we go to the book of Revelation, it speaks about two witnesses. Okay? Two witnesses that stand before God. The book of Zechariah chapter 4 speaks about those two witnesses as well. The two olive trees that send these oil, right, to God's people. So these are two witnesses, and Ellen White very clearly says, God's word God's words is saying that these are the two witnesses, the Old and the New Testament. Because directly, after it mentions the two witnesses in the book of Revelation chapter 11, it talks about, not directly, indirectly, about Moses and Elijah. Moses and Elijah. Because these two witnesses have power to bring plagues anytime they want. And, and they also have power to restrain the heavens from giving rain. Now, when did that happen? During the time of Moses, the plagues, and during the time of Elijah, the rain didn't fall from heaven for three and a half years. So indirectly, in the book of Revelation 11, when it speaks about the two witnesses, it speaks about Moses and Elijah. But Moses and Elijah is a symbol or a type of the Torah, Moses, the one that gave the, the five books of Moses, and then the rest of the inspired writings is the testimony or Elijah. Does it make sense? All right. If you haven't thought of it that way, that is actually what the word means. Because in the time when, when John was writing the book of Revelation, the New Testament was not put together as it is now. But all the expired, expired writings is the testimony. Right? So we should actually not divide the Bible into two parts, the Old and the New Testament. Because it can bring confusion. Right? As some churches believe there's an Old and a New Testament, meaning an Old Covenant and a New Covenant. Well, the covenant doesn't change. Huh. Are you with me yet? So it confuses people from the Old to the New Testament. Things didn't change. All that changed was the reality came. Everything that the Moses and the law spoke about, Jesus Christ, is come now in the New Testament. And the New Testament is just revealing all the symbolism from the Old Testament. Does it make sense? And the covenant is explained. Because now the prince of the covenant has come to ratify the covenant. Does it make sense? All right. So this is what he's talking about. We found him, Jesus, of whom all the scripture has been spoken of. So let's see if we find him there in the sanctuary. The great truth set forth by the types and shadows of the Mosaic law were brought to view. And faith grasped central object. Of that system, the Lamb of God, that was to take away the sins of the world. So who is the central object of that system? It's Jesus, the Lamb of God. The Lord Jesus was the foundation of the whole Jewish economy. Its imposing services were of divine appointment. The last paragraph there, Christ was the cornerstone of the Jewish economy. And of the whole plan of salvation. In the book of Zechariah, it says it so beautifully to me. Zechariah 6, verse 12 to 13. And if, as you remember, as I went through the sanctuary building, 
the physical things of the sanctuary. We started with, right, the arrangement of the camp and the building of the sanctuary in the beginning. And then we went on through the furnitures and the high priest and so forth. And I want you to see how I am going the same way through the sanctuary and bring out Jesus in every part of it. So, the building of the sanctuary. Who built the sanctuary in the wilderness? There were two guys that built the sanctuary. Remember that? Their names were Basileel and his assistant Aholiab. Can you remember their names? What the meaning is of their names? Fascinating. Their names mean in the secret place. Are you with me? Or in the dwelling place under the shadow of the Almighty. Wait a second. Psalm 91 verse 1. David was somehow thinking about these two builders of the sanctuary. And he writes that verse, Psalm 91 verse 1. The names of Basileel and Aholiab. Now, if you read the verse in Psalm 91, verse 1, He that dwells in the secret place of the Most High and abides in the shadow of the Almighty. That is a wonderful description of the sanctuary message. That is where we find our place of refuge. That's where we need to be every single day in Christ Jesus. So even the names of the builders is Jesus Christ. Now, I can just imagine, as I said previously, that these names, they were born at a certain time, and their parents gave them names. Who told them to give them their names? And that they are going to be the builders of the sanctuary. Amazing, isn't it? God has a plan. God knows what He's doing. And it points to Jesus. Even this text very clearly points to Jesus. Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place and he shall build the temple of the Lord. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be a priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be between them both. There's more to this text that I'm going to explain right now. All I want you to see is he is the builder of the sanctuary. That building represents him. Let's look further. In John 2 and Matthew 12. Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building. That was Herod the Great that was helping them to, to beautify the temple even more. Wilt thou rear, up, rear it up and in three days you will break it down or build it up? Jesus says, I'm speaking about my, my body. I am that temple. I am that temple. And in Matthew 12 verse 6, but I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Jesus said about himself, I'm greater than that temple. Because I'm the reality. I'm the reality. I'm the antitype. What about the camp layout? Does that point to Jesus? The whole camp layout? This is fascinating. This is fascinating. You remember Balaam? What did Balaam do? He was a, he was a prophet of God, but he was a compromiser, right? So the king of Moab comes to him and says to him, I want you to curse Israel. <laughs> the audacity of, the, of, of this prophet going to God says, Lord, should I go or should I not go? He should know better than that anyway. So he takes his journey, go on the high mountain, and as he wants to curse, blessings come out of his mouth. We should study these blessings more often that comes out of the mouth of this prophet. Because this is amazing. Look at this. Now, I told you, when you stand on that mountain and you look down on the arrangement of the camp, what did you see? Come, students. You see not just the cross, but the throne room. But it was in the form of a cross. Remember I showed you that? The arrangement of the camp was in the form of a cross. But that picture is a prophetic picture of what will happen when everything is over and we are around the throne of God. Because we have God on His throne, Jesus and the Holy Spirit, we have there, we have the four living creatures, we have the 24 elders, we will have the 144,000, we have all the angels, we have all the redeemed, the great multitude, around the throne. 
And you only see that if you read the scriptures and you find the different pieces of the puzzle. In other parts of scripture, in the book of Revelation, it's a prophetic view of God's throne right there from the top of that mountain in the form of a cross. The form of a cross. But listen to the blessing he's, he's giving as Balaam is speaking. For from the top of the rocks I see him. Wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. What does he say? I said, from the top of, top of this mountain, I see him. I thought he sees building and tents and, and a sanctuary there. What is it? He sees him. Amazing, isn't it? From the top of the rocks, I see him. And from the hills, I behold him. And lo, the people shall dwell alone and shall not be reckoned among the nations. So he looks down that mountain, gives a blessing, and he says, I see a person. Isn't that incredible? In that arrangement of that camp, we see Jesus Christ in his whole plan of salvation. That is beyond my comprehension. But he carries on, he says, yes, but I see him, but not now. That's prophetic. And I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. So he sees in that arrangement the prophetic picture of the Messiah that will come, and all the work that he's going to do. What was the arrangement around the camp? They were divided into four groups of three, in their four winds directions. And every tribe, every tribe had a flag, but then every leading tribe of the three groups or the four groups, also had a flag. Remember the, the flags or the signs? The, the flag of Judah was the lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. Then we had Reuben going clockwise around the sanctuary on the southern part. We had Reuben, the man's face. He was the leading tribe there. And then we had going to the, to the western side, which was Ephraim, which was the sign of the ox. And then we're going to the north which is the sign of an eagle. That was Dan. But we know that these point to Christ. Let's see how it does. The lion, the Bible tells us, the lion of the tribe of uh, Judah in the book of Revelation, other places, book of Proverbs and so forth, gives us those, those um, um, uh, symbolism. The lion symbolized Jesus as our Savior. Right. Man's face, Jesus in his humanity. He became as a man to this earth, right? As a faithful high priest. If he didn't come in his humanity, he could not be a faithful high priest. Very clear from the book of Hebrews. Book of Hebrews. Jesus had to be made just like us so that he can be a faithful high priest for us. That's the man's face. What about the ox? Jesus is the sacrifice and our sin bearer. That's the, the symbol of of the ox because the ox is also a symbol uh, or in the Bible it's called the bullock that was offered as a sin offering um, uh, many 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 types of occasions the eagle right it's a symbol of judgment God is, Jesus is a righteous judge judgment was given to Christ right in all those verses you'll find that answer for judgment so the eagle represents swift judgment righteous judgment and the protection of God's people. That is eagle. That is Jesus. Jesus is the righteous judge. So if we follow the four faces of these angels. And I want to just add this. These, these four living creatures. These four beasts. Right. Are cherubims. Ezekiel is very specific. He says these are cherubims. I have heard among seven day adventures. They say that maybe there are some redeemed. That were taken to heaven. Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says very clearly they are cherubims. They are a high order of angels. Right, with the faces. So the lion is Jesus, represents Jesus. That flag represents him. The man's face represents his humanity. The ox, the, the sacrifice that is given to us in, in dying for us. And the eagle, that he is the judge. All right, so even the camp layout there represents Jesus. What about that white court? around the sanctuary, in the outer court. 
It says in these verses, in these days, Judah shall be saved and Israel shall dwell safely. And this is the name whereby he shall be called. The Lord our righteousness. Everywhere in scripture, I don't think there's any question in anybody's mind that the white fence is the righteousness of Jesus. The moment you go into that first gate, into, into the outer court, you are covered by the righteousness of Christ. To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He may be just and the justifier of Him which believes in Jesus. So the moment we enter into that gate, God, Jesus justifies us. He's the justifier. There was no unrighteousness in Him, in His humanity. That's that white fence. What about the gates and the veils? Usually when you come into the outer court, that was called the gate. And then the first curtain that that go into the holy place was called a curtain, but also a veil. But I think there was a very few places that I found it was called a veil. It was called a curtain. The one that was called the veil is the curtain that separates the holy from the most holy place. What is the, the meaning of these gates or veils? Right? Does it point to Jesus? It says here, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which He has consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, His flesh. Now what does it mean, His flesh? It means His humanity. Jesus becoming human, He made a way for us to reach to God, to the Father. Does it make sense? Right, He prepared that way for us, so that we can go boldly to the throne of grace. Jesus also said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter, he shall be saved. I am the way, Jesus said. So those doors and veils represent Christ. And in, a, in, in one of our um, lectures later on, I will prove to you that you cannot enter without faith. In all three of these entering points, you have to enter by faith. Salvation is by faith alone but that's not in this lecture for now what about the altar of sacrifice that's an easy one to see because the altar of sacrifice is the first thing you saw when you come into the outer court where all the sacrifices were burnt that represents what calvary the death of jesus on the cross and walk in love as christ also has loved us and has given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. Jesus represents every single offering that was brought on that altar. For I determined not to know anything among you save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. That price that was paid for us is symbolized by that cross, uh, by that altar. And it carries on to say, pointing to Jesus as the sacrifice, and beheld low in the midst of the throne, in the midst of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood the lamb as it has been slain on that altar. The lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. And as I said to you, go read again Isaiah 53. That Prophecy about Jesus is talking about a complete sin offering. Jesus was the sin offering. Behold the Lamb which takes away the sins of the world, but with the precious blood of, God, of Christ, a Lamb without blemish, without spot. All represent the innocent Lamb, which is Jesus without sin. Even the burnt offering. Let's go through the four offerings, the four main offerings that were brought to the sanctuary. First, the burnt offering. The burnt offering points us to Jesus, a full surrender that Jesus gave. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. No man takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, I have power to take it again. This commandment I have received of my Father. Jesus says, remember I said to you the burnt offering in Scripture, in the book of Leviticus, tell you that was a voluntary offering. Anytime you wanted to bring it, to consecrate your life to God, when you bring that offering, you are saying, 
as Jesus has consecrated his life for me voluntarily, I'm giving my life to him as a, as a full sacrifice. That's what it means. So the burnt offering points to Jesus, his full consecration to us as, as, a, as a sacrifice. What about the meat and the drink offering? And when he had given thanks and break it and said, take eat, this is my body which is broken for you, do it in remembrance of me. After the same way, he took the cup, he drank it, and this is the, the blood of the New Testament or the New Covenant. So that meal that we use in communion points to Jesus. And that is a meal offering or a meat offering in Scripture. Even as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom to many. His life of ministry is a meat offering. That's what it means in Scripture. Jesus says unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So the meat offering and, and, and the, 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 the bread and the wine that was given is a full saying, Everything I have is in service for you. And that's what Jesus did for us. The peace offering or the fellowship offering Remember, it was a specific offering, promises that were fulfilled, vows that were completed, and uh, also it was when you had a thankfulness for promises that came true. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be on his shoulders, and his name shall be called the Prince of Peace. So that peace offering, offering pointed to Jesus as the Prince of Peace of the Covenant. Because if a covenant is fulfilled, a peace offering was to be brought. So every time an offerer would bring a peace offering, it is a prophetic act that Jesus will fulfill the covenant. And he is that covenant. He is the prince of that covenant. For all the promises of God in him are yes and amen unto glory of God. So when a promise was fulfilled in your life, God has given what you, what you said you're going to promise to him, you fulfilled your promise. Everything worked out. You bring a peace offering. And Jesus alone is the yes and amen of every single promise. For the mountain shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from thee, neither shall the covenant of my peace be removed, says the Lord that has mercy on thee. Every single peace offering pointed to the covenant that Jesus would fulfill. What about the sin and trespass offering? Well, that's easy to see. Jesus is the sin offering, that lamb. And it was only the sin offering, as you can remember, it was only the blood of the sin offering that was taken into the sanctuary, not the other sacrifices. The other sacrifices' blood was, was sprinkled on and around the altar. You remember that? But only the sin offering and the trespass offering, when the blood was taken, it was taken into the sanctuary for the high priest and for the congregation when they sin. For the common person and the ruler, the sin offerings, blood was just put on the horns of the altar outside, but the priest ate a piece of the offering. And so when he go into the holy place, he defiled the sanctuary. The same way the blood was sprinkled into the holy place. Only with the sin offering. And only with the sin offering, this, the blood was put on the horns of the two altars. So when we come to the Day of Atonement, as we're going to do this afternoon, you will see that is the place where the sanctuary is cleansed. Those horns. Because the sin of Israel were defiling the sanctuary, defiling the altar, and defiling the sanctuary in the holy place by the altar of incense on those horns. So he cleansed those horns with that goat. Okay, we're going to look at that this afternoon. Jesus is then the sin offering. Behold the lamb which takes away the sin of the world. In Hebrews 9, Paul says, uh, Nor yet that he should offer himself often, as the high priest enters into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world, he has appeared to put away sin, by the sacrifice of himself. He was the sin offering. In, this, in all the sin offering, trespass offerings that were brought. And then Isaiah 53 
tells us that Jesus is the substitute. He is the sin offering. What about the water laver? Let's move on to the water laver. Is that a, a pointing to Jesus? Does that point to Christ? Also very interesting, and I want you to understand this concept. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straight away out of the water. The heavens opened. So the, the water laver represents what? Baptism. Baptism. But I want to add something here, which many of you maybe have not thought about. Did you know that the, the baptism has a specific symbol connected to it? It is when you die with Christ. Are you with me? You are put under water. You die. But in the same time, the baptism has also the symbol of resurrection. You are quickened with Christ. You are resurrected with Christ. Am I right? So the, the, the whole water laver is that whole symbol of death and resurrection. So it's not just baptism in that sense that you go under the water, but also resurrection. That's very, very important. So I want to give you an idea that you can play in your mind with. When Jesus came from heaven to earth, he followed a certain pattern. So when he came to earth, he was first baptized and then he was crucified. So follow the sanctuary. If you come from the most holy place, you come to earth through the holy place, what do you find first? The water laver. Jesus was baptized first. Are you with me? Then he died. And then he was resurrected. There's the pattern. There's the pattern. He came from heaven to earth. First the water laver. He was put in baptism. He died. And he was resurrected. The whole baptism was seen in the outer court. The symbol of baptism was in Jesus Christ. That's what I want to try to explain. If you read Romans 6, verse 3 to 5, you'll find the whole process that Paul is describing in the book of Romans. The candlestick. If you go into the first curtain, you have the candlestick on your left-hand side, on the southern side of the sanctuary. That's very easy to see. Jesus came. He says, I am the light of the world. He that follows me, not walk in darkness, but shall have light of light. That was the true light which lights every man that comes into this world. Jesus is that light. When Jesus comes into our lives, He lights up that person. He sees the truth, and He walks in that light. What about the table of showbread? That's also easy to see. I am the bread of life. I am the living bread, which came down from heaven. If any man eats of this bread, he shall live forever. Jesus is the bread of life. The altar of incense. That's also very easy to see. I think we concentrate on that quite a bit. In, in looking at types and antitypes. It is Christ that died, yes, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also makes intercession for us. For there is, no, there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. Wherefore he is able also to save them unto the uttermost that came unto God by him, seeing he lives, he ever lives, to make intercession for them. Jesus is our intercessor so the the um, altar of incense points to christ as the intercessor same with the the as i showed you this morning with the incense points to jesus what about the ark of the covenant does that point to jesus does that point to jesus is he the ark of the covenant jesus said himself think not that i've come to destroy the law or all the prophets I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. Now, it's interesting that sometimes when we read this text, we're thinking of Jesus came to fulfill the law. But he came to fulfill the law and the prophets. I mean, everything was said in the Bible is about Jesus. He came to fulfill. So Jesus became to fulfill the law. Those that were not here in the first, first lecture, where I spoke about the law and the prophets, not the law and the prophets. Yes, it's the law and the prophets. The law and the gospel. The law and the gospel, which is the law and the prophets. Okay? The law and the gospel. Here are they who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Alan White calls it the law and the, and the gospel. The law and the gospel. Commandments of God, the faith of Jesus, the gospel. 
for the law and the testimony. The law and the gospel. And then we looked a bit deeper into this, and we looked at the sanctuary, and we came to the conclusion that the sanctuary, the tabernacle, was the dwelling place for the law. Now, if the sanctuary points to Jesus, then what can we say? That Jesus is the dwelling place of the law. But wait a second. Isn't the law a transcript of the character of God, of the Godhead? So in Jesus dwelt all the fullness of the, the Godhead bodily. So what can we say? That Jesus, when he came to this earth, became what? The sanctuary and the dwelling place for the law. That means he came to exhibit the character of his Father, the character of the Godhead. That is amazing. That is why Jesus says, I came to fulfill the law because I am the law. That's my character. That's the character of the Godhead. I came to fulfill the law. I am the law. You cannot separate them. Next text, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness and will hold thy right hand and will keep thee. That is God the Father telling the Son, when you go to earth, that is what I'm going to do. And give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles. The Lord is, is well, well, well pleased for his righteousness sake. And he will magnify the law and make it honorable. So this is a conversation that the father has with the son. And saying when I send you, I will be at your right hand. I will give you as a covenant to the people. The ark of the covenant. The ark of the covenant. That's the covenant. And you will magnify the law and make it honorable. That means you will show the character of us as the Godhead to the universe. To the universe. What about the mercy seat? Is Jesus the mercy seat? Is Jesus the mercy seat? Very clearly in John. And he is the propitiation, which the original word in the Greek means mercy seat. For our sins. He's the mercy seat for our sins. He's the grace for our sins. He's the mercy for our sins. And not for us only, but for the whole world. Here in His love, not that we loved God, but He loved us and sent His Son to be that mercy seat for our sins. And very, very interesting, the Old Testament in, in Psalms 85, verse 10. Mercy and truth are met together. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. You see that in this, in this Ark of the Covenant. There's the truth. The God's law. The truth. And this lid is the mercy. So mercy and truth, truth met in the most holy place. In the Ark of the Covenant. Mercy and truth met. Where else did mercy and truth meet? On the cross. Remember I, when, I, when you look at the sanctuary. I've showed you the two squares in the sanctuary. In the middle of the square. Is the, oh, is the altar of burnt offering. It was in the middle. It was Jesus' crucifixion. At the cross, mercy and truth met. Mercy and truth met. Satan wanted to separate them. But Jesus showed on the cross that these two belong together. Mercy and truth. Righteousness and peace. Now you go right through the sanctuary. You go to the most holy place. And mercy and truth in the final work of God. Mercy and truth will again meet in his children. In the covenant, the fulfillment of the covenant of God. That means Jesus will be formed in us. The hope of glory. The work will be complete. He started the work on the cross. Mercy and truth met. As we walk with Jesus in our lives through these ministration of the sanctuary, we'll look at salvation later in the next lecture. But as we walk with Jesus, after He has justified us, as we walk with Jesus and He changes our hearts and He's fulfilling the covenant, what is the end result of the covenant? His law written in our hearts. The Shekinah glory is returning into the remnant. The Shekinah glory will return in the remnant. And mercy and truth will meet in the most holy place, the work will be finished. Because God has promised that He will fulfill the covenant in each one of us if we allow Him. 
if we allow him. Let's read those verses. Is Jesus the Shekinah glory? Well, John testified of it. He says, Jesus was full of glory. The glory from the Father. That's the Shekinah glory. Full of grace and truth. Grace and truth meeting in Christ Jesus. And book of Haggai, I will shake the heavens and the desire of all nations shall come. And he will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than the former. Why would the glory... Uh, oh, wait a second, wait, let me just backtrack a little bit. Haggai was the older prophet during the time of the exiles. Are you with me? When they went back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple, they were crying because they were looking at this temple and, and, and it didn't compare to Solomon's temple after it was broken down by the Babylonians. And now they're trying to rebuild the structure. They were crying and, and Haggai is, is trying to encourage them. And this is his encouragement. He says, the desire of ages will come. But when he comes, the second temple, what you're building right now, will have a glory more than Solomon's temple. Because who will come to that temple? Jesus will walk into that temple. Because he's the Shekinah glory of that temple. Even he shall build the temple of the Lord, and he shall bear the glory, and shall sit and rule upon his throne. Jesus is the Shekinah glory. What about the high priest? Is Jesus the high priest? Is Jesus the high priest? I think we have no question about that. Hebrews 5 is 1 to 6. For we have, for, sorry, for every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men and things pertaining to God. As he says, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is our high priest. Jesus fulfilled everything of the high priest. I'm not going to read everything. You have the notes. You'll find the notes in there. But Jesus fulfilled every single thing from the high priest. And he was inaugurated. Also, he was anointed as a high priest. As I shared with you a little bit earlier this morning. What about the high priest's garments? What does that represent? Does that point to Jesus? For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have what done what? Have put on Christ. As a garment, as a clothing. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Jesus is the representation of that whole garment. Every single piece of it pointed to Jesus and his work for us. And that is what we see the beauty of Christ in this verse. One thing I have desired of the Lord that will seek after that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life and behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. We put on Christ. We put on that wonderful garment of the high priest. So I just have this as a closing, a representation in the sanctuary of what I was speaking about uh, now during divine service. We found out that Jesus is the, the door. He is that way into salvation. We cannot come to salvation going through without going through that specific door. So the first gate is the door, the entrance to salvation. We saw that Jesus is the Lamb. Every single sacrifice point to Him on that altar. Then we saw that Jesus was baptized and resurrected. That's the water laver. And then He ascended to heaven to start His work in ministration in the holy place. Still He's the door. Still He's the way. Every single one of those curtains represent Jesus through His humanity made a way for us to get to the Father. And then Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus is the light of the world. And Jesus is our mediator, intercessor. Then we go through the last door. All right? The experience of the remnant. The experience of the remnant. Where the covenant promise needs to be fulfilled. Where His law is written in our hearts. That Jesus is that law and the Shekinah glory. He wants the Shekinah glory to be in our lives. Now, in the book of Revelation 18.1, it promises us that there's a fourth angel. There are three angels, the three angels' messages. There will come a fourth angel that will light up the world with the glory of God. Have you read that before? That is what it's talking about. 
The final work, when God pours out His Holy Spirit, His latter rain, this world will see the Shekinah glory, the covenant being fulfilled in God's remnant people. To strengthen the messages of the second and third angel. To finish the work here on earth. And probation will close. May God bless you. As we keep on studying the sanctuary, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the lessons from the sanctuary. We see that everything in the sanctuary points to Jesus, our wonderful Savior. Will you guide each one of us, Father, as we, as we study these things? Open our minds, as my friend Jesus' name. Amen.